I wanted my photography just to give that hot air uh, around those people. I would definitely feel the movement, how everyone's like spinning around. You obviously, with your work, you have strong feelings towards dance. You have strong feelings towards what you're going to see. Whereas I'm, I'm trying to be, in a way, detached where I can just tell it like it is. This picture, you know, really stuck out to me. It was, uh, that's just a very esoteric photograph, but yet you know there's something terrible happening. <laughs> well, I, that, that picture is, is really responsible for kind of pushing my aesthetic in a different direction. Like from, so? from Well, from when I took that picture and, and all the response that I got to it over the years, I realized that creating mis like an aesthetic which creates mystery, which is beautiful enough to capture the audience's attention, where you stymie someone, the person looking at the image, and because they've been stopped, what's going on? They're asking themselves, and they take a step closer to the content. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, I was a little tipsy, and I was driving <laughs> in a car uh, to a party. It was, the, the, I think, uh, the day the war ended. And I was going across the bridge uh, over the Tigris River in uh, Baghdad. It was a really hot day. It was probably about 120. Um, and he was jumping. He had, this man had climbed up the lamppost and was literally jumping into the Tigris River to cool off to go for a swim. Uh, so th there's nothing actually wow. okay. uh, horrible about it. It's actually he was just going swimming. But I managed to capture that. A Baghdad that, diving board. A Baghdad diving board. I don't know why I, I call this picture the blue man, even though he's actually not blue, he's a silhouette. But um, I was on a assignment for Time Magazine in, in Las Vegas. So I ended up in the Palms Hotel. And I take a step back and there's a tattoo artist in the, uh, in the actual hotel. And we just started talking. He's like, dude, I, I got 15 minutes. You want to get a tattoo? I was like, and this is, okay, I've done like five, five hour energy drinks right now. And I'm just drinking Diet Coke and it's like, not a, not a great time to not, make a not a great, like a you know, that's going to last on me forever. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, let's do something. And uh, what can I do in 15 minutes? Uh, and, and he was looking through my website, and that picture came up. I was like, OK, let's do that. And we just threw it on my, nice. threw it on my arm. Yeah, knowing your background, I thought that it under this man was ex exploring. And then it was a bomb or something. And it threw him up. And you know, you know instead of. You're telling it was a jump down, but I thought it was. This picture is, is one that we kept on coming back from the Night Goggle series. Obviously, this is not a happy ending. No. This is at the beginning of the um, Sunni Awakening where uh, oh. they were getting a lot of Sunni informants who didn't want Al-Qaeda in Iraq in their town. And I, I, to be honest, this is me personally speaking, I think they were just picking out people they didn't like. They just walked into this mechanic shop, and this guy was just sleeping. And they just woke him up and, and arrested him. And something like this, especially in the dark, they can't see me half the time. I don't even know if they knew specifically that I was standing right there to take that picture. Most of the time, you go out in operations where you use night vision. It's something called zero illumes, where there's no stars, there's cloud cover, there's no moon. I would have actually one night vision goggle that I would look through to walk, and then one on front of my camera. Well, what's interesting about being with the American military is like, you know, American military doctrine is like overwhelming firepower. If one guy fires at you, 50 Americans will fire at him with everything. The whole idea is like, our soldiers' lives are worth so much, and ammunition is not really worth anything. So let's use as much of it up as possible. And, and so it, it's, you never want to be on the other side um, of, of that, the way American soldiers fight. Going into any situation that I'm putting myself in, I'm aware 
but that is part of my job, my burden, is to look beyond what I'm photographing and try and make something beautiful out of it, even though that might be contradictory to the situation I find myself in, um, namely, you know, war. You were telling us that your wife doesn't want you to go to war anymore. You know, my wife went into labor with our second child about an hour after Tim Hetherington's memorial. I think it, it, it hurt my wife and, and it really bothered her and, and you know, um, and I, I've been open about this before. When Tripoli was falling, I really wanted to go back to Libya for a little bit of closure. I promised my wife, I said, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna shoot around the violence. I'm not really gonna go to the front lines. And, and I ended up sharing a car with two of the, the greatest war photographers of this generation. Uh, uh, Yuri Kozarov and, um, and Ron Haviv. And Ron and I and Yuri were in the staircase and a sniper uh, shot down, straight down the stairs. And this rebel was running in front of me, about five feet away from me, and his head just exploded in front of me. I saw him fall and then watched the cascade of his blood going down the stairs. And then Ron and I, as we photographed it, realized that we were the only people still in this building. And we ran out. Uh, and as a grenade sailed over our head. And, and Ron has this video of us running out and you see this little black ball. Amazing. And um, I looked at my pictures at the end of the day of this man dying at the moment of death. About two or three weeks later, I, I, in the middle of the night, I said, I'm gonna send this picture into my agency because my wife's not gonna see it. Because I knew already I had broken my promise. And within an hour, she had seen it. My phone bill was about $4,000 for that two weeks I was there, I, just begging my wife not to leave me because she said I, it was like I cheated on her with war. I mean, how do you prep to, to go to war? Logistically getting ready to, to uh, you know, go shoot in, in, in war zones or, or, or difficult places is, is probably the most important thing. You, that anyone can do. The best thing I ever owned was antibacterial underwear made by this company where it actually eats the bacteria in, in, in your shorts. In your shorts. And I, because, you know, during the war, I went to Darfur in 2004. That was six weeks of literally the same socks. Did not change them. I mean, these are small things that obviously the people in that place don't even think about. And we dancers change three, four times a day, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, it's like... like... <laughs> three showers a day, you know. <laughs> I love this that was a, a lot, too. That was a lucky shot, these two dancers around the opposite directions. You know, I, I see them move. I want them to run into my frame, you know what I mean? And uh, it happened and uh, just... Uh, it's incredible. It's as if they are one. Hi, I'm Mark Seliger on the set of Capture, and with me are the great photojournalist Ben Lowy and my friend Misha Baryshnikov, actor-dancer and a very good photographer in his own right. Make sure that you don't miss a single episode of my show by clicking the subscribe button below. And leave a comment if you'd like, and of course, share with your friends.